Hey guys, so this is going to be a follow-up video to the last one I did on the EG4 48 volt 3000 watt inverter. So I've got a few more items I wanted to go over in this one, so I'll get started here. So for idle consumption, I have my batteries down here. Focus out a little bit. And if I turn the breakers off to these two, I'm going to see how accurate this is. Or at least get a reading from this also. The shunt and the battery. The BMS. So 1.1 to 1.2, I see it fluctuating. Amps. And we'll take a look here. 0.9. So it's probably somewhere around 0.9 to 1.2 amps. I'm not going to put a shunt on it just to get all the way refined. At times 52.5. So it's somewhere around 57, maybe 56 to 60 watts of idle consumption. Idle consumption meaning what the unit is using just to run uh, without any loads on it. So, so I'm not going to go over all the settings. There's a bunch in here, and there's a bunch to go over. Again, you can look at the link that I'm going to post, and uh, you can go to the online manual, or if you get it, obviously you can, you can read your copy. But I will go over a couple of the settings that I think are fairly important or interesting for this video. The first setting I wanted to go over real quick is power saving mode. So this isn't going to be something that everybody uses, but you saw the idle consumption test I did there, so around 60 watts. So I tested it with this, and I couldn't even get a reading on the clamp meter as to what it's using. So it's using very, very little uh, in this case. So if you had a uh, cabin or an RV where everything was going to be shut down for the evening, and you didn't want it draining on your batteries at all, uh, if you don't have any loads on at all, this is essentially going to go to sleep. So once your loads come back on, uh, it comes back on. So in that case, it's probably pretty useful. For most people, it probably won't be because they're going to have some kind of tiny load on all the time, but maybe not. So this could be useful for people. I thought it was an interesting setting to mention anyway. Setting 5, I did put something in the last video on it, but setting 5 is where I put it on uh, 4 here, and that's the EG4 protocol so that it can recognize my battery. So that's a pretty important one if you have EG4 batteries. If you are using lead acid or if you're going to build your own, uh, then you would pick a different protocol, but that, uh, that's what I use. Setting 6, I have it set on that, and uh, that's why it can restart <laughs> when I stressed it out too much with my load. So it's auto restart when I overloaded it with all my load tests in the last video. So setting 12 and 13 uh, both go into when the batteries are going to click or the system is going to click over when the batteries are too low and they'll click back. So this is going to allow bypass power from the grid through the inverter to your panel if you have grid uh, into it. So I'm going to get into that a little bit more here in a bit, but these settings, and there is a few more that pertain to this, are going to allow the grid to flow through this inverter, bypass through it in case your batteries are too low. So whether it rained or uh, whether the system is down from, uh, yeah, just not enough charging, whether you've had too many loads on it, whatever, uh, you have that option also. So even though it's an off-grid inverter, the grid can flow through this into the panel that you've designed uh, if you have it wired that way. So yeah, I'll get into it here in just so they sent this cable with the wireless dongle, so you could mount it up on the wall here somewhere. Uh, I think it's a like a four-foot cable, looks like, close to it. So it doesn't just hook or plug into the inverter itself. It has this uh, cable that comes with it. And I'll show you what the app looks like here in just a minute. So taking a look at the PV, I've got a 2400-watt array hooked up to it. The sun's not quite in the right direction for it now, but... We're at 12 amps, so we're 2,000, a little over 2,000 watts coming in to the unit now from solar. By the way, I'm right next to the unit with it uh, running. Basically, this is what it sounds like, full blast. So 
so not bad at all with all the PV coming in. And here's the app that comes with it. Uh, so, yeah, I'll put a picture of the actual app that you need to download. It was a pain in the butt. I kept, I was pretty frustrated. I couldn't figure it out, but I was, I was trying to use the wrong app uh, with the inverter. So, yeah, I'll put a picture of the one you need uh, to download if you're going to get this inverter. But yeah, overall, it's a good, there's a lot of detail in the app. Uh, you can look at the detail of what settings the inverter has through the app, but you can't change any settings. So it's basically, it's a monitoring app. So you can see your battery capacity. And there, I think it shows, yeah, it's showing how much uh, solar is coming in, the voltage of the solar. So for, for monitoring something, if you're not close by, it's actually pretty decent. I didn't expect it to be that nice, to be honest. So this is my sub panel. But let's just for the sake of this, let's assume this is a grid panel. After you've established your critical loads panel to the left or the right of this panel, preferably somewhere close, make it a whole lot easier. And you are now ready to transfer some of your loads over there. You've got a conduit. It's already grounded and it already has a neutral in it. Everything's ready. And you're ready to transfer some of the loads. So this is... This could be your fridge. Let's call this one your fridge here. So this 20 amp breaker is your fridge and you're ready to move it over to your off-grid panel that the inverter will be feeding. So everything's gonna be shut off. You're gonna have take all the safety precautions. You're gonna know what could still be hot from the meter. Um, you're gonna assume everything is hot until it's been proven otherwise. So you're gonna check and see with the voltmeter and make sure you don't have any power to any of your breakers and you're going to make sure that you respect what's coming out of the meter. The lugs up top would still be hot. So assuming all that's taken care of, and assuming you don't have an electrician doing this, and you, uh, you feel capable, this, would be your, this could be your fridge breaker here. And you're moving it over to the other breaker panel. You would loosen this here. Every box is going to look a little bit different. And there your fridge is. Now again, this panel is not hot anymore. Checked it, but I think I should stress that multiple times. This is where these come in. You can use wire nuts also, but these Wago connectors, and I'll put a link below, these are for 12 gauge wire, and they can do 14 gauge wire also. These are both essentially the same thing. These can be a little easier to deal with because they're just a straight run, but you can use either one. All you're going to do, your fridge is going to go in here. So the fridge is still tied in down the line. And then you're probably going to end up having stranded, or you should, stranded 12 gauge wire. A lot easier to bend through the conduit into your other panel, into your critical loads panel. So this flap would go up. And you are going to have a 12 gauge wire. 12 gauge stranded, preferably, going into a conduit here to your other panel. Just wanted to show this wire is going to go in there. You'll clamp it down. Once it's all the way in, you'll know it. They do not tug loose. They don't wiggle. They're really awesome, the Wago connectors. And again, this is for 12 gauge also. Just make sure when you're looking at them, if you're looking at them on Amazon, these are UL listed also. Just make sure you check what gauge they are. This goes from 24 all the way to 12. These are 10 gauge Wago connectors. So if you were going to move your hot water heater over, once you get, uh, depends on the inverter you're using. Uh, but yeah, you would, you could use larger gauge wire in this uh, for things like, because it's a 30 amp connector. So things like your water heater, you could put two of these, transfer that over your well pump. And once they're clamped down, that's it. So this connection is going to stay in your main panel, preferably somewhere out of the way down below. And you, you want to label it. So if you can put a little sticky on there or something that says fridge, it'll make it a lot less confusing if you ever had to move it back to the main panel. Uh, but that's once you have that panel established with a ground and a neutral, uh, this is how you would move loads over if you have a nice conduit to put all the wires in, uh, or a couple conduits. So it's not overly complicated, and what's nice about this too is that 
if you find that it's using too much, then all you're going to do is remove this and install the breaker right back where it was. So if it was the uh, microwave and you say that's using too much because I've got, you know, five different rooms with lights on them, I don't want that on there or whatever it was, then you would put it back in here. But if it's something you want to keep, obviously it just stays right there in the main panel. Okay, so here's a quick look inside the inverter. So before I get into that, I would say if you needed to get in here for any reason, uh, make sure to chat with Signature Solar first before you do any anything inside the inverter. That way you won't uh, avoid any warranties or there's, there'll be no issues there. So the first thing I wanted to point out is, uh, because I had a couple people talk about this in the last video, so this is the grounding terminal here on the far left. Uh, but as you can see, it's grounded to the case. And the one below that you saw in the first video would be grounded to the case also. So this is a ground, and there's a few reasons uh, so there's a couple reasons for a ground in general, right? And I'm not going to get into everything, but the ground is always going to be grounding the case of the inverter, just like you'd have a ground uh, in your panel. So on your breaker panel, it's going to be grounding the case uh, there also. That way you, it doesn't become a conductor, right? If something were to go wrong, if, if a positive end up touching this and you touch it, uh, there's not going to be any uh, issues there. So Grounding the case is pretty standard for everything. Even when I put in my wire way, you ground that. So you don't want uh, the metal to become a conductor. So yeah, like I was saying before, this terminal essentially just goes to there. The one down below uh, goes to the same thing. All right, so the second thing I wanted to talk about real quick, right here is where they used to put the ground neutral bond screw. Uh, it is no longer in the newer units the second generation units. So as far as what that does, it's pretty simple in the sense that that is neutral there. And when you put a screw in, it's bonding it to the frame here, which is grounded. So that part's uh, not complicated. But there, it, there's an article I put in the description on my last video, and I'll put it in here on this one. Signature Solar wrote an article on uh, demystifying the ground neutral bond. So I'll put that in there. I'm not going to give uh, specific advice on what you should be doing. There's different ways to wire this. So an off-grid, without this screw in there, you can bond the panel like I did uh, in the last video. So you can see there that it's still bonded, it's just in the panel instead of the inverter. Um, and then technically if you are receiving bypass from the grid, that's already bonded at the grid. So that is going to be in the terminals here. Uh, so it's already going to be bonded that way, but uh, there is different ways of wiring it, like I said. So I'll put that article again in the description, but just wanted to give you guys a heads up about that. All right, guys, so before I wrap it up on this inverter, I just wanted to say that the reason I thought it would be a good beginner's inverter uh, or entry-level inverter would be not just the price, which I think is... Uh, pretty good for somebody to be able to get into solar at this uh, wattage range, but also because it's a 48 volt inverter. So if somebody's going to start out, I really wouldn't recommend starting out at 12 or 24 volt unless it's needed in like a camper or something like that, uh, that you already have a lot of 12 volt items. And even then, uh, it's much more efficient to go to a 48 volt. So when you're talking about something uh, with this uh, price range that you get all the stuff with, uh, and to be able to start out at 48 volts, I prefer that. So if somebody wanted to expand in the future, get a more expensive, uh, larger inverter, or whatever, they already have the battery bank uh, for a 48 volt. So that's one of the reasons. And the other reason was, or one of the other reasons was, like I mentioned before, when you open it up, it's a lot less intimidating inside. So I think that's one of the main three reasons. And I may draw something up in a video coming up where I show a graph. Uh, with everything in there. But uh, yeah, intimidation. So I think the first one would probably be finance. So people just can't afford to get into solar. Uh, but then the second would be knowledge because they may be able to afford to get into solar, but they don't really know how much it costs. So And, and so those blend together, right? So the knowledge of, of how much the components are going to cost 
So it may be more expensive than you think, or it may be a lot less expensive to get into an entry level system than you think it is. Especially, like I mentioned before, when you can have that panel separate from the other panel and just a few loads on it. So it may not be as expensive as you're thinking, and you can build over time. And then the third would be that intimidation factor. So I want people to be safe. Um, so it's not that I don't want people to be cautious, but with the knowledge part of it, um, you don't have to be worried or intimidated by what uh, you're doing. You can take your time, go slow with it, and know exactly what's coming up next and, and what it takes to be safe. So intimidation, I think, is a big one. People feel like if something were to break, I won't be able to fix it because I have no idea what I'm even getting into. So to that, I would say watch more, read more, um, and learn how, you know, start to finish how to do this. Some of this, when you get past the safety factors, some of it is going to come as you're using the system. Uh, so obviously that's not the safety part of it, but just in, in using these systems, you kind of get accustomed to different terms and stuff people are using. But yeah, I'm not trying to preach a sermon here. I'm just saying uh, at some point, you you have to get in somewhere so it's good to if you can uh, start small or start larger uh, i started a little bit i guess i started midway through um, and you know some people start out with the 18k which is i guess if you're looking at me it'd be on my right um, which is running over there so the 18k pv so that would be sort of a larger inverter much more a uh, lot more options different things to go into this one's a lot more simple, but still has a lot of options on the menu. So if you guys are still here after that monologue, <laughs> I wanted to I wanted to put a measurement thing in here. I didn't put it in the last video, and so I'm not dragging the camera over. So just take my word for it. We are at, it's 13 and a half by 16 and a half. So very small footprint on this one. So yeah, guys, thanks for watching. I hope I did this one justice. There's a lot of people that like these inverters, uh, so it seems like it has its own fan base. <laughs> There's people that have built portable power stations out of them. They're just cool inverters. So thanks for watching, guys, and stay tuned.